wise decisions for 2016. The best way I could think of to kick this thing off is let's look at the worst decisions in 2015. Here. You're in the Super Bowl. You're like first and goal on the three-yard line, and you have a running back who has a mode of running known as beast mode, and you decide to throw the ball. That's where the play starts. Ball right in front of the Seahawks receiver. Next picture. Doesn't turn out so well for the Seahawks right there, and they lose the Super Bowl. Now, because I'm a Niner fan, I don't really care if that's their worst decision, right? But there's other worst decisions in 2015. Go to the next one. Yeah, if you want to get closer to nature, that's got to be the worst decision of 2015 right there. It's amazing what you can find on the internet. Go to the next one. Okay, if it's your job to do the new layout on the van for Starbucks and that's what you came up with, um, there's an execution problem right there. Go to the next one. I like chocolate milk and I like Pringles. Milk chocolate Pringles though, that's a bad idea. I'm guessing somebody got fired over that. Go to the next one. Mm. No commentary needed. Go to the next one. Yeah, no regrets in 2016. <laughs> Oh, that's just awesome. Let's just look at that again for a while. Um, it makes your 2015 not look so bad, right? But did you have any regrets last year? And it, maybe regrets is like too strong a word. And maybe even to say, in 2015, did you make any bad decisions? Maybe that's even too strong a word. Let me ask you this. The decisions that you made in 2015... Were there any that you look back on and you just go, I wish I would have had just a little bit more information. I wish in that situation I would have known who to trust or exactly what to do. I wish I would have known who not to trust because if I would have known who to trust and who not to trust, I would have decided this or I wouldn't have decided that. Can you think of any situations last year that if I just would have had a little more wisdom or if I would have known those people's habits or their tendencies, then I probably wouldn't have made this, that, or the other decision, right? I don't know if you start thinking back at what last year looked like for you, um, but my guess is that, man, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? And we look back on our past and we go, oh, if I only would have seen this. But listen, there's nothing you and I can do about 2015, right? Right? But all we can do is look at 2016 and just say, our best days are going to be ahead of us. But better days require, require better wisdom. Meaning, if you and I think that we're actually going to have a better year in front of us without learning anything or searching for wisdom or trying to learn something about God, what are the wise decisions that we need to make, then really, better days ahead is just a pipe dream for you and me. Better days require wiser decisions. And so that's why we're starting the year this way. To say, how do you and I actually start making decisions so that we do see better days ahead? So here, here's my goal. There's a story about a guy in the scriptures who who's, it's stated that he's the wisest man that ever lived at the time. His name is Solomon. So I'm going to read his story and try and make some observations about his life, the kind of wisdom he got, um, how he actually received that wisdom from God. And then I'm going to make one final invitation to you about what this journey looks like for the next five weeks for us. And so here's what I want you to do. If you have a Bible, open up and just go to uh, 1 Kings chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, super simple to find this. Grab the one in the chair in front of you. It's probably black. And... Uh, it's page like 238, okay? Just want to make sure, because if I said, hey, turn to First Kings, you'd be flipping forever, right? Um, so go to page 238 somewhere, that'll get you in the right neighborhood. And if you don't have a Bible at home, here's what I want you to do. Just take that one with you. That's yours, okay? We'll replace that. It's just kind of how we're bent here at this church. We just want everybody to have a Bible and just have access to it, okay? So First Kings chapter 3, I'm going to read a little bit about Solomon here. Real quick background on his life. Solomon's dad is King David, pretty important guy in the Old Testament. He has a brother named Adonijah. Now, David is really old in this section of Scripture. He, he actually dies in the first couple chapters. And so think about this. Solomon's dad 
is on his deathbed. Adonijah's dad is on his deathbed. But before David dies, Adonijah, the older brother, elects himself as king. That's slightly disrespectful to your dad. Your dad didn't pick you as the king. You decided you're going to be the king, and he's not even dead yet. So David does this. He anoints, not just elects, but calls like the priests and the prophet together, and they anoint Solomon, the younger son. They anoint him king over Israel. So here's what you get. You get this guy, Solomon, who's a young man at best, and he's now king over the entire nation of Israel. And to say the least, Solomon needs some wisdom to make wise decisions. Now, if you think about your life, about whether you, how, whether you have wisdom or you don't, or exactly how much wisdom do you have, it's really easy to say this. Hey, listen, you don't know the family I grew up in. I don't have a lot of wisdom. I don't have a lot of tools in my resource bag because I grew up in a family that was totally dysfunctional. Solomon too. You know how he got his family? His mom's name is Bathsheba. Do you know the story of David and Bathsheba? David's like up in his castle and he's like looking down and sees this woman bathing. I don't know if that's how she got her name Bathsheba, but. And he's like, she's hot and I think I want her. Yet she was married. David seduces her and then kills her husband. They have one child, David and Bathsheba, who dies, and then Solomon is born into this really dysfunctional family. So the next time you think your family's super jacked up, just saying, read Solomon's story, and you're going to go, okay, my family, yeah, it is dysfunctional, but Solomon had a lot of wisdom, even though he grew up around a lot of dysfunction. So I hope that for some of y'all, that raises some of your hope, and maybe you grew up in a super functional, great home. That should give you hope too, like, hey, I'm a couple steps ahead of Solomon. My situation's better. But it's at this moment where in this kingdom that Solomon's trying to reign, that God shows up and makes Solomon an unbelievable offer. Here's what it is. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5. This is what God says to Solomon. At Gibeah, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. You ask me, whatever it is you want. Just what do you want me to give you? Could you imagine if God wrote a blank check to you? I mean, this is essentially what God is doing. What do you want? You just ask for it. And the implication is, it's yours. Let me introduce you to how my mind functions. Like if God showed up and asked me that, I have two lists of things that I would want. The right side of me, which is probably the proper and the good and the, the noble side and the side that you're only going to get to see, is a list of noble things to ask for. Oh God, protection for your people and the kingdom, right? It's like a noble thing and like people look at me and go, that king is so smart. He's just such a good guy. And I, I've got a whole list of those things that I, I would ask for. And then there's the other side of me, and it's the side that is kind of darker, a little more selfish, and like, oh, but this is what I really want. God, if you could give us like 10 times more money than we would ever need, because most of the biggest problems in the world are all financial, right? If we took care of the biggest problems, the rest are probably manageable, right? Or God, would you always put someone from my family on the throne and protect me? Or God, would you wipe out my enemies? Because there's people all over the world that sitting on the fringe of our kingdom, they're looking for weaknesses to come in and attack us and wipe us out. I mean, that's the story of Israel's existence even still today. But all of those things, they just go right by Solomon. And here's, here's his response. If you look in verse 7, partway in that verse, it says this. Solomon says, I am only a little child, and I don't, know, I, don't care, I don't know how to carry out my duties. I'm only a little child. I do not know how to carry out my duties. Um, let me make some observations, starting with this verse, that might give us some wisdom into how wise Solomon already was. Um, wisdom requires humility to see that self-sufficient is insufficient. What does Solomon say? God, like, I'm a young man. I'm supposed to rule this nation of Israel? There's no way that I can do this. God, I'm like a little kid asked to do something that's overwhelming. Have you ever heard people tell you this philosophy? God's never going to give you anything more than you can handle. You know that's garbage. <laughs> it's not even true. Because how boring would your life be? 
You get a situation that comes your way and you know, someone asks for some wisdom, you gotta make a decision for business or your family, and they're like, so what do we do? And you're like, I got this. Oh, that's easy, you just do this. You would never be in need for wisdom, you would never be in need for want, because God never brought anything your way that you couldn't handle. It's not actually true. I mean, one of my, several of my greatest moments in life is when something overwhelming came in front of me and I'm like, God, I can't handle this. Because the truth is, God will never bring something your way that with his power, with his wisdom, with his guidance, with his presence, that he won't bring you through. But to say, he's never gonna bring anything in your life that you can't handle, that's just not true. That's, that's just man's wisdom or people's wisdom. The truth is, there's moments like this in Solomon's life where he just goes, there's no way that if I'm totally self-sufficient in this moment in my life, that I'm gonna be able to handle it. It's insufficient. Now, I don't know how um, confident slash cocky you are going into your new year about what it is that you think that you can handle and what you can't handle. If you think, hey, you know what? I'm not even sure I need God's help. Let me just, you can jot this note down. It's not in your notes, but um, let me just encourage you to read Proverbs 16, 18 at some point. It starts like this. Pride goes before destruction. And it goes on from there. Just inviting you all to read that one. (laughs) Because the moment that we think we can handle life on our own, we're fools. Truth is, I know this about myself because I spent some years trying to live on my own without God's wisdom, without God's presence, without God's people around me, and I made a train wreck of my life. I'm really grateful to God that he rescued me from that, but the truth is this. Me in and of myself, in my own self-sufficient thinking, I don't have enough wisdom to lead a church. I don't have enough wisdom to lead my own family. I don't have enough wisdom to lead my own life. And my guess is that Hopefully you feel the same way, that there's moments in your life where, where, man, if God would give you wisdom on something in 2016, you're all ears and you're ready to listen. Here's how else he responds. Listen to this. In verse 7 also, here's how it starts. He says, your servant, notice how he approaches God. He doesn't say, hey, God, this is the king talking. (laughs) He just says, God, your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number For who's able to govern this great people of yours? Whose people are they? God's or Solomon's? God's people. He doesn't say, hey God, this great kingdom that you gave me, hey God, my people that are here, you gotta teach me how to lead my people because you've given this to me so it's mine. Here's what I want you to recognize about wisdom. Wisdom recognizes that we're managing God's resources, not our own. You know who gets this wrong a lot? Churches and pastors. <laughs> you ever heard people describe, oh, that church across town, yeah, that's Tim's church. Oh, that, that church across town, Bob's church, or uh, Steve's church, and whatever name, it ain't their church. They might be the lead pastor, the senior pastor of that church, but it ain't their church. And by the way, those lead pastors, they already know that. It's just like this verbiage that we have. Do you own a company? Do you ever say that? Well, my company... <laughs> Really? I know you own it. I know you run it. But the truth of life is this. You and I, at the very best, are managers of everything we have. Can I prove it to you? When you die, who does it belong to? It don't belong to you because you're not around anymore. It might belong to your family, but guess what? They're going to kick the bucket too. And then who does it belong to? Then you're thinking, oh my gosh, I have this grandson. I pray to God it doesn't belong to him. (laughs) The truth is, you and I, at the very best we can do is manage what God has given us. And so I'm just wondering if we might say, God, what's the wisdom then? That when I get done with it, whatever it is that you've entrusted to me, that it's better when I found it. It's better now, after I've had it for a while, that we manage it well. And so Solomon, he keeps going on He then says this, and this is his big request in verse 9. Ready? Here it is. He doesn't ask for money. He asks this, so give your servant wisdom. And in your version, it might say this, give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? Ever walked into a decision where you're like, hey, listen, I'm just going to do the right thing. 
you know, I'm, I'm a Christian, committed to doing the right thing, so I'm going to do the right thing. And then you walked in, and you're like, oh, there's four options, not just two. And you're not even sure which one's right. Like, is this right over here? Because that one kind of sounds right, but then when my mom told me that was right, I was pretty sure it was wrong, because my mom told me it was right. And so now maybe this one's like, you're totally committed to doing the right thing, but you have no idea what the right thing is. Do I date him? Do I not date him? Which one of these four do I date, God? I mean, you're trying to figure this out. What's the wisdom that you want me to pick? And God, I'm committed to doing the right thing, but you actually don't know what it is. And so Solomon says this. He's like, God, I'm going to have people come my direction. They're going to tell me the story of their life and how they need help. I'm going to have other kings visit me. Hey, should we join in partnership together? God, should we not? It's like, God, I'm committed to doing the right thing. And Solomon just says this. I know I will not know what the right thing is. So God, give me wisdom so that I can distinguish between what is right and what is wrong. And in that moment, Solomon recognizes in and of himself he is insufficient, that he needs wisdom to determine what's right and wrong. And here's what it is. Point number three is a little bit of wisdom to know that he can't handle it led to a whole lot more wisdom. Listen to what God says to Solomon. Verse 10, the Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. Verse 11, so God said to him, since you've asked for this, and not, not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for <coughs> excuse me, wisdom, discernment in, adjusting, in administering justice, I will do what he, you have asked. I'm going to give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. He not only gives him wisdom to be the smartest man that walks the earth, but he says, I'm going to give you the wealth, I'm going to give you the power, I'm going to give you the prestige above all of that. So it's interesting, if you actually read the next couple chapters, you got to like chapter 4, verse 29, let me just read to you uh, Solomon's fame here for a moment. It says, God gave Solomon wisdom, and very great insight, and a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sand on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the people of the east. I read that, and how I interpreted that was, what's to the east of his land? All of Asia. He's smarter than all the Asians of his time. That's funny, people. You're like, can I laugh at that? Yes, you can. That's funny. Ray Pond, can we laugh at that? He's an Asian friend of mine. He just gave me permission, okay? Solomon was smart. I mean, the high schoolers, in in his high school, they were signing up to be on his project team, right? So that they could glean from his wisdom. It's interesting because it says this, the kings around the earth, around his kingdom, they would come and pay Solomon for his wisdom and his partnership. Solomon, though, God makes this stipulation. If you go back in 1 Kings chapter 3 and you look up verse 14, Here's, what's God, here's what God's stipulation was. It says this. And if you walk in obedience, and if you want to, just underline that. If you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life. Here's what I want you to understand. Number four is wisdom. And you could write blessing over this. Blessing, we're conditioned upon obedience. You know, there's some of us... Um, We've, we know what the decisions are moving forward in 2016. You've got these decisions to make, these situations, these conflicts, these work adjustments, these investments. And you're just looking at this going, okay, what, what's the wisdom? And I know that there's some of you that you're looking at this and saying, God, would you give me your wisdom? Either gift it to me or help me learn it. And, and if God gives you that wisdom, then this is what you're going to do. Okay, God, I see your wisdom here, and now I'm contemplating whether I'm actually going to do it, whether I'm actually going to follow your wisdom. And for some of you in the room, I'm going to tell you this, that's okay. For others of you in the room, not okay. And here's what I mean. If you are not a follower of Christ, and you're, you're here at church, I'm so glad you're here. Great, perfect time of the year to start. New Year's resolution, we're going to church this year, awesome. We're talking about making wise decisions. Who doesn't want that? But listen, if you don't have a relationship with God where you know who Christ is, 
and you have a couple years of, of experience where you can look back on and you can see how God was faithful to you, where he gave you wisdom, and you actually obeyed it, and it turned out for your benefit, if you don't have that kind of experience, then I would say this. Look for God for wisdom. Ask him what it is. Try it. Because I know that some of you are just going, you know, I'm really curious about what God's wisdom will be. I don't know if I'm, gonna, I'm all in or if I'm going to obey it. I get it. You're not a follower of Christ. You don't have a relationship with him enough to know that you can trust him. However, if there's a group of you in the room who are followers of Christ, you've been following God, and he's shown up and shown off in your life over the years, and you can honestly use the word from the scripture that describes God as faithful, and he's been faithful to you, then let's be real honest. Um, Solomon wasn't saying, hey, God, um, why don't you give me wisdom, and then I'll decide whether I'm going to obey it or not. Same thing for you. If you're a follower of Christ, and you've been walking with him, you know that God is faithful. You're not asking, God, let me evaluate your wisdom to see if I'm going to follow it or not. You're writing a blank check to God. Whatever it is that you say that you want me to do, and you give me your wisdom, I'm all in. I'm going to do it. Because I can trust you, and I believe that you are good, I believe that you love me, and you have the best intentions for me. So let's stop and think about this for a moment. What category do you fall in? You fall into the category of someone who's sitting there saying, you know what, I, I'm not questioning this obedience to God. I'm all in, and I'm going to obey. But I just know that there's some of us, that there's some situations in our life that are emotional, that are difficult, that we're not really sure how it's going to turn out, and if we make a decision, uh, you know, we're not, we're not sure we want to follow God. And I get it. Wrestle with that. But I'm going to challenge you to say whatever wisdom God gives you, because he's good and he loves you, that you can trust him. Now, here's what's interesting about Solomon's <clears throat> his wisdom. It was a gift of God. I don't know exactly how it happened, but we know that he just said, God, God said, I'm going to give you wisdom. I'm going to like download it to you. And I don't know if Solomon was like, like God downloaded wisdom in, but, but it wasn't learned. God said, I'm just going to make you like this. Wouldn't that be awesome? He's like, no, no, no college for you. No studying for you. You just, you're going to be wise. And it's interesting because it wasn't just kind of this wisdom to lead. He would lecture about, the scripture says, he would lecture about plants and trees and animals and insects. He had a wisdom that was beyond like, oh, so what does the Bible say about that? Like, it was just unbelievable wisdom. It was a gift to him. Now, we would all love that, wouldn't we? If I asked you, and why did you say, hey, would you write down the big decisions you have for 2016 and pray for God's wisdom? And you write it down, and you say, God, give me your wisdom. And you're just waiting for the download. Like, oh, here we go. Here's the truth. Some wisdom is gifted to us, but the truth is, most wisdom is learned. And man, it's the shortcut to be gifted with it. In the New Testament, it talks about a spiritual gift of discernment, a spiritual gift of wisdom. I mean, you have two people in front of you, and they're both telling you different stories. Who do you believe? Some people, just by their spirit in them, they know who's lying to them and who's telling the truth. There's other people that they just understand that there's a sense of wisdom about them. Just understand this. I'm not inviting you to a series where I'm just asking you to pray that God would download wisdom in your life. The truth is, we have to learn it. Here's the cool thing. The wisest man who ever walked the earth, Solomon. He wrote three books that are all included in the Bible. Ecclesiastes, okay? If, if you're under like 40, the book makes no sense. You know why? Because when you're younger, you're idealistic. You're like, the, the world should just operate like this, and the world should be fair. Don't have a 17-year-old read the book of Ecclesiastes. You're like, that book, it just, because it says everything is meaningless under the sun. You're like, no, 17, the world should make sense. And when you're like 95 and you read it, and you're like, oh yeah, most everything in the world is just meaningless under the sun. Um, and then you get to the book, The Song of Solomon. If you've never read that, it's an R-rated book that actually in their time, you were not allowed to read this as a youngster. Can you imagine telling your kids, you can read anything in the Bible, just don't read the Song of Solomon. <laughs> Guaranteeing you the Bible's being read that week, all right? <clears throat> I'm just suggesting you not read it while you're single, okay? <laughs> all the single people are like, I'm going to read that book this week. Um, and then there's this book called Proverbs. 
And Proverbs is these wise wisdom sayings that Solomon wrote. So get, this is why I want you to get this. We're going to read the book of Proverbs. And for the next five weeks, we're going to be in the book of Proverbs about how do we get this wisdom of Solomon? How do we learn it? And so I'm going to invite you into this learning process that you and I together are going to learn this. So just turn to Proverbs chapter 1 real quick. You're going to flip to the right, that direction, just a little bit, almost in the middle. You get to Psalms, 150 of those. <clears throat> get to Proverbs chapter 1. And this is how he introduces <clears throat> his whole wisdom book. Proverbs 1.1. 1, 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. And then he starts verse 2 with, let me tell you why I wrote this book. <clears throat> Excuse me. For gaining wisdom and instruction. For understanding words of insight. He tells us right off the bat why this book exists. I wrote it for you. So that you and I could have this book and I could download my wisdom to you. But it's just not going to go straight to your head. You have to learn it. And so this book of Proverbs is written so that you and I could have wisdom. And I'm just telling you this, if you read this and you study this and you keep asking God, God, what is your wisdom for me? God wants to answer your questions about what the wise decision is in 2008. So if you're taking notes, number five is just simply this. Wisdom is both gifted and it is learned. And my invitation for you is this. In the next five weeks, will you start on this journey with us to start learning what God's wisdom is for you? That, that's, my, that's my invite for you. Um, so where do we start? Like, what does Wisdom 101 class look like? If you were a freshman at Wisdom University, what's the first course that you take? And it's interesting because Solomon states this, I think, a dozen times in the book of Proverbs. He says, here's where wisdom begins. And it's found in Proverbs 9, 10, and it simply goes like this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I would love it if he said something different, because it just, it would preach better. <laughs> I, just, I wish he said something different, because it'd be easier to explain. Because I've been walking with Jesus for a lot of years, okay? And I've heard pastors preach on this, and what is the fear of the Lord? I don't know why I sounded like that just now, I sound like an old pastor. What is the fear of the Lord? And they, they'll say, oh, it's, about, it's about awe, respect. Like, you have to have this awe of God and this respect of God. But the, the New Testament, as well as the Old, talks about God's a God of love. He's also a God of discipline. But he's also a God of wrath. In both the Old Testament and the New Testament, well, what about that? And if your God is loving, how can you fear him at the same time? And I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm not going to try and remove the tension of that. I don't totally know how to, how to explain it. But yes, we should stand in awe of God, in reverence of God, being aware that he disciplines his followers whom he loves. And yet he's still a God of wrath in the New Testament. He's called, he's a consuming fire. And yet he loves us and he's our daddy all at the same time. And so I was, I was looking at this this last week and, okay, God, when it comes to, to wisdom, and the very beginning of wisdom, the place to start, wisdom 101 is the fear of the Lord. <clears throat> How do I wrap my mind around that? And I just came across this and <clears throat> I just made it up and it seems to make sense to me. And so here's what I want to do. Take a look at this. The fear of the Lord is this statement. That if you and I can state this genuinely, I think this is the beginning place of wisdom. More than what I want, I want what God wants. <clears throat> more than my wants, desires, likes, hopes, more than the list inside my head that runs on the left side that goes, oh, I'd really like all this. More than that, I want what God wants. It's a pretty amazing statement to say, you know, I, I trust him. I really believe that he has the best intention for me. He has the best intention for my business, for my marriage, for my kids, my family. He has the best intention for this church. Therefore, I can make this statement with confidence. More than what I want, I want what God wants. So my next question is naturally, so what does God want? And it's not that moment where we go, okay, God, well, just tell me. Download it. Instead of being gifted to us, and maybe he'll do that with you, 
In the next five weeks, maybe he will just gift you with wisdom for the next decision that you have to make. But I'm guessing that he's going to help you learn it. Read it in his word, and you're going to ask him, God, is that for me? How do I apply that to my situation? Because here's where people mess up with Proverbs. Get this. Make sure you get this. Proverbs is not a promise book. When people read Proverbs and they're like, oh, it says, you know, raise a kid in the way that they should go and they'll not depart from it when they're older. How many of you parents did the best job you could at training your kids to follow Christ and they're not as an adult? You're like, see, Proverbs isn't true. Proverbs are not promises. Proverbs are wisdom statements to help us do the next right thing. Was it right for you to raise your kids to know who Christ was? Yes. But God gives us this freedom in this world to choose what we will do, and your kids have freedom to choose that. And we, you and I, parents, we pray that God would help them choose him. So it's not a promise book. So where do we begin? I'd like us to begin this morning by just stating this. Fear of the Lord. Here it is, God, more than what I want. I want what you want. So God, God, what do you want? Can I ask you this question to just wrap up? What are the big decisions coming up this year? For me and my family, we're, um, we're counting down to be an empty nesters. I'm not like saying like, <laughs> we're counting down to be an empty nesters. Like, <laughs> get them out. I, I'm saying like, I have two more summers with my daughter. I'm only, thinking, I'm only counting a summer and a half probably. This next summer and like, before she goes off to college, she might be like, hey, I'm leaving early for college. I'm out. I'm counting like that half a summer. So what is the wisdom, God, that I need to do with my daughter in the next year and a half so that she leaves with the tools and the skills, more importantly, the heart for you that I know you want her to have? God, what do I do? That's different than saying, hey, God, for vacation, I think we're just going to go to Disneyland this year. Nothing wrong with Disneyland, okay? If you want to go to the Tragic Kingdom for your vacation, God bless you. But but God, how do I actually help my kid develop the heart of Christ? And I got a year and a half. Now, if you're trying to cram that in, like, because you just can't cram wisdom. I'm just saying, it's not like your biology final. You can cram biology information, but you cannot cram wisdom. Financially, this next year, God, what do we do? What's the thing you want us to do? With each and every one of your jobs, your businesses, whatever it is you're doing, God, what's the wisdom you have for me? What's the direction? I don't want to just be reacting to everybody else in my place. I want to actually make some wise choices. So what does wisdom look like for me? I know this in every marriage. Intimacy ebbs and flows. And there's moments where you feel a mile apart, and there's moments where you feel so close together. Hey, God, instead of reacting to this intimacy ebbing and flowing, what could I do and decide and make wise decisions that those ebbs and flows would be smaller? That I might not just react to my spouse saying, hey, you haven't been here in a long time. What would it look like for me to exercise wisdom so that the ebbs and flows were smaller? There's a great question for our marriages. I think the questions are probably pretty long about decisions that you and I can possibly make in 2016. The question, I think, will be this. Will it be our best year to say, God, I'm going to write you a blank check this year. And the blank check is a blank check of my obedience. I'm all in. Would you just show me what the wise decision is to make? And we'll go from there. So those are my observations from the life of Solomon, and it just gets us into this place, here's my invitation to you. I just want to invite you, five weeks, let's journey together in this thing. And my invitation consists of this. The first is this, would you read a proverb a day? Just proverb chapter one. There's like 31 of them, so read through proverbs, um, read through all of them, and uh, one a day. Start tomorrow morning, okay? Piece of cake, right? The the second is this, when you read through, um, whatever sticks with you, Whatever jumps off the page at you, or maybe there might be some Proverbs where you read it, you're like, I have no idea what any of that meant, except for that one verse right there. I I got that one. Would you just write it down somewhere? I don't care if it's digital, you copy it out of your U version Bible, or you're, you're keeping track of a journal. Like, would you, either way, 
write it down about what sticks to you, okay? Read a proverb a day, write down what sticks to you. The third thing is this. Would you just get together with some group of, a group of people and just talk about what it is you're reading? So just don't do this alone, okay? Just talk about what it is that you're learning and what it is you're reading. You can share like, hey, I heard this in the message Sunday morning. This, this is what I learned. I know for some of you, you're like, wow, so I, I, I got the reading part. I, I can do that. That's going to take me like six and a half minutes a day. Done. I'm going to write some down. That'll take me three more minutes. Good. I'm under 10 minutes and I'm good to go. But you want me to like meet with people and like talk about, where am I going to find people who would be willing to get together and talk about this stuff? Well, guess what? We've already solved that for you. We have community groups in our church that are actually launching today where everybody is saying for the next five weeks, I'm going to read this. I'm going to write this down. We're going to get together once a week and discuss this. Don't you like the way I just backed my way into that? Yeah, you're welcome. And so uh, right at the end of service, Pastor Josh is going to explain what to do, how to do, and, and get involved in that. And I know for some of you, you're like, okay, r- wow, r- risky step. Read, read a chapter in the Bible a day. And some of you are like, man, I, I haven't read the Bible in like 10 years. I had a gal right after the last service. She came up to me. She's like, I haven't been to church in nine years. This was cool. I don't know what she was expecting, but she came to church for the first time in nine years and talked to her. And like, she's all in. I kn- it was a risky step. But you're like, okay, I'll, I'll read a chapter. Okay, I'll write something down. But that third step, you're like, ah, that one's a little riskier. Hey, I'm just saying this. Journey with us at your pace, but I think the reward far outweighs the risk. And I know some of you, y'all aren't new to church. You've been around here for like five years. And you're like, that whole community group thing, man, those people are terrifying. I don't want to show up to a group. Hey, take a chance. Take a chance and join one. If there's weird people there, you don't have to go back. We have, do you know this? We have a, like a three-week, no questions asked policy in our groups. You go to a group one week, you don't have to show up the second week, and no one will call you. You can try a group the second week and show up and try them out, and if you don't show back up, no one's going to call you because there's no questions asked. If you go to a third group and there's still weird people in there, I'm just questioning maybe it's not them. Okay? So that's my invite to you. And here's the fourth thing, okay? Would you start jotting some notes down about what 2016 looks like for you? Hey, what's the wisdom that you really need? Because here's the really cool part about God. When you start reading his word and talking about and trying to learn what wisdom looks like, what it learn, looks like to learn and follow Christ, and then all of a sudden you meet with a group of people and you learn even more, and then you're looking at your life and all of a sudden these things all come together and you're like, God, I'm facing this situation and you gave me this wisdom. That's God showing up and showing off in your life. I'd love to get to the end of 2016 and just hear story after story after story after story about people who committed themselves to not just learning obedience, uh, learning wisdom, but obeying it, and to say, this is what my year looked like. I remember, <clears throat> I remember a couple weeks ago, at the end of the year, someone came up to me and said, you know what? This is the first year we've ever gone to church. It's the first year we've ever done this, and this has been our best year ever. That's not a coincidence. That's a life that's committed to figuring out who Christ is and following him. So if your best years are going to be in front of you, let's learn God's wisdom and walk with him and let him show up and show off. That's my invite to you. No pressure, but I pray that you'll join us in that. Let's pray. Lord, thanks. I just think it's fun, God, to look at your word and see what it is you have in store for us. It's like this big adventure where we just slowly get to see what you have next for us. And Lord, I know this, there's people in this room that they got some really heavy, weighty, life-changing decisions in 2016. And maybe they don't even know it yet, God. But this is gonna be a big year for them. And I pray that you would help them to dig in and really anticipate that this is gonna be an adventure where you're gonna show up and show off. But God... Truth is, we have to engage in it. We would love it if all the wisdom was just gifted to us, but truth is, it is learned. And so help us to learn well and help us to keep an eye on our lives to see when you actually show up. And uh, if you're in for joining us in that, would you simply say amen?